Well, good morning, and welcome to Northwestern Methodist Church uh, here at Reflection Ridge. It's so great to have you join us this morning, whether in person or online. Um, we have uh, just one announcement, um, and that is giving. Um, if you want to give to uh, the ministry here, you can give online at northwestfmc.org slash give, or you can give at the offering place at the back of the uh uh, our gathering area by the doors. Um, we give out of abundance of what God has blessed us with. So if you want to give to support the ministry, and those are the those are the ways that you can give. Um, and so uh, we are uh, thankful for your support of Northwest. Uh, our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 48, verses 9 through 11. It says, "We dwell in your faithful love, God, in your temple." Your praise, God, just like your reputation, extends to the far corners of the earth. Your strong hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the towns of Judah rejoice because of your acts of justice. Gabe is going to lead us in worship this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I invite you all to stand as we worship on this Sunday morning. <laughs>
celebrate 4th of July. And everyone is alive with no missing fingers. Hallelujah. Amen to that. But it also brings us back to worship with each other. And that's, you know, every, every Sunday that I always come, I always say that. But I got to remind you that, you know, I believe that truly. So I have to say it every time. So it's almost like a ritual I'm performing. But it's a, it's a worthy ritual is what I should say, right? <laughs> Amen. This is my father's world and to
altar in our song and prayer. I ask that you take whatever position is comfortable for you. Whether it be standing, kneeling, or sitting.
We thank you that we know that you are a healer, that you heal people and nations and groups. We just ask that you continue to do your work. We ask that the Spirit be our guide as we dive into Scripture this morning. We pray for these things in your name. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. This morning is uh, Communion Sunday. It is the first Sunday of the month. Um, and so we will read through the liturgy. Um, just a reminder, we have gluten-free elements. Um, there are also the um, non-gluten-free uh, uh, wafers on top of the cups if you'd rather have a wafer rather than gluten-free bread. But I don't think anybody makes that choice. So, <laughs> um, so we will go through, uh, and then I will bring communion to you. Um, you who truly and earnestly repent of your sins, who live in love and peace with your neighbors, and who intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking in His holy ways, draw near with faith, and take this holy sacrament to your comfort, and humbly kneeling, make your honest confession to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we confess that we have sinned, and we are deeply grieved as we remember the wickedness of our past lives. We have sinned against you, your holiness, and your love, and we deserve only your indignation and anger. We sincerely repent, and we are genuinely sorry for all wrongdoing and every failure to do the things we should. Our hearts are grieved, and we acknowledge that we are hopeless without your grace. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us, cleanse us, give us strength to serve and please you in newness of life, and to honor and praise your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us continue our confession as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who with great mercy and promise, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to you with hearty repentance and true faith, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from our sins, make us strong and faithful in all goodness, and bring us everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for inner cleansing together. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. It is always right and proper in our moral duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the inhabitants of heaven, we honor and adore your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord, most high. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We do not come to this your table, O merciful Lord, with self-confidence and pride, trusting in our own righteousness, but we trust in your great and many mercies. We are not worthy to gather the crumbs from under your table, but you, O Lord, are unchanging in your mercy, and your nature is love. Grant us, therefore, God of mercy, God of grace, so to eat at this your table that we may receive in spirit and in truth the body of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and the merits of his shed blood so they may live and grow in his likeness, and being washed and cleansed through his most precious blood, we may evermore live in him and he in us. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who gave and loved your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon a cross for our redemption, who by his sacrifice offered once for all to provide a full, perfect, and sufficient atonement for the sins of the whole world. We come now to your table in obedience to your Son, Jesus Christ, 
who in his holy gospel commanded us to continue our perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, O merciful Father. We humbly ask and grant that we, receiving the bread in this cup as he commanded and in the memory of his passion and death, may partake of his most blessed body and blood. In the night of his betrayal, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is given for you, preserve your soul and body into everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed upon him in your heart with thanks, by faith with thanksgiving. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve your soul and body into everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. As a reminder, we practice open communion. You do not have to be a member uh, to receive communion here.
benediction for communion. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be yours now and forever. Amen. Um, even pastors struggle with a little foil in the communion, <laughs> the communion <Yeah>. thing. <laughs> um, so we are continuing our series uh, through Exodus of what God has done. Um, and this week we are in Exodus 19 through 21. Um, Exodus 19 through 21 is the beginning of the explaining how the Israelites will respond to God. Uh, so last week we talked about how God provides for Israel through bread and meat, through water, through protection, and then through leadership. Um, and this week we're going to talk about what God expects from the Israelites. Um, and so this is the beginning of the passing of the law uh, from God to Moses and Moses to the Israelites. Um, so there's a lot that happens, uh, is going to start happening as we continue in and it's very regulation heavy. It's very, uh, there's a lot of rules and understandings of rules. Um, and so this week we're in Exodus 19. We're going to read through verses 3 through 8. Um, and it says, Then Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. The Lord called him from the mountain and said, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth. For all the earth belongs to me, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. So Moses came down, called together the people's elders, and set before them all the, these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all responded with one voice, Everything that the Lord has said we will do. Moses reported to the Lord what the people said. Um, so last week we talked about what God has done for the Israelites. They, he's brought them out of Egypt and then in the desert he's done these food, water, protection, and leadership. Um, and mostly what the Israelites do in, that, in those stories are complain. Um, and then in chapter 19 it switches. The blessings of God and the election of Israel as his people becomes contingent. Um, this is a bit of a new idea, but Abraham has some of these conditional blessings based upon his obedience. Adam and Eve have some of these conditional blessings based upon his contingent, but he was, God was always with them. This is the first time that uh, God kind of says, uh, I have, I have chosen you as long as you do these things. Um, and so in Abraham, this is the, in Genesis 22, 16 through 19, this is what it says about Abraham's blessings that he receives. It says, The Lord's messenger called out to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I give my word as the Lord as that because you did this and didn't hold back your son, your only son, I will bless you richly and I will give you countless descendants, as many as the stars in the sky and as the grains of sand on the seashore. They will conquer their enemy cities. All the nations of the earth, earth will be blessed because of your descendants. Because you obeyed me. After Abraham returned to the young men, they got up and went to Beersheba, where Abraham lived. Um, so this comes right after uh, Abraham has offered up Isaac as a sacrifice, and the Lord saves Isaac, um, and then the Lord blesses Abraham because he lists, he just does what God asks him to do. Most of the time, um, what God is doing is he is uh, it's a uh, obedient, or it's a, it's a command, promise, and then obedience. And this is the first time where uh, there's a command, there's obedience, and then there's the promise. Um, and so that's different for Abraham, and he doesn't put a limit on this declaration of covenant for Abraham. This is a general blessing that he is promising Abraham and his descendants. This is different than the covenant of Israel mediated by Moses. For the, the covenant that Moses establishes with God and with Israel, it is contingent on the obedience of listening and following what God commands. Right? So, 
you might be wondering why doesn't God offer to Moses and the Israelites an unconditional covenant like he did Abraham? I think there's a few things that are different about this covenant um, that help explain some of that. Um, the, different of, the difference of this covenant is that with Moses and the Israelites, God is offering not just blessings, but a total shift and change as a people. Uh, he says that he is offering priests and a holy nation. That is very different than what Abraham receives, um, which is um, just uh, continued, uh, continued generations of his, of his line of descendants. Um, and so this is a bit of a shift as to how God is relating to his people. To establish a nation state that God will make holy is not an easy task. This idea is picked up for us by Peter for, for the followers that are in his church in 1 Peter 2, 7-10. So God honors you who believe. For those who refuse to believe, though the stone the builders lost aside has become the capstone, this is a stone that makes people stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Because they refuse to believe in the word, they stumble. Indeed, this is the end to which they were appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. Once you weren't a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so Peter is continuing this idea that God is offering to the Israelites in Exodus that is a total change of situation and station if they are obedient to what he commands. It's no longer just your descendants will live for a long time and be a blessing to the world, which is a good promise, but it's holiness and mercy, prized possession, and special care. Right? We all have a prized possession that we hold on to dearly. Um, in uh, my former office, if you came in, you would see that there are multiple things that are irreplaceable, that have been handed, that have been made by my grandfather, or handed down from family to family. Um, the Bible that my great-grandfather had when he was a pastor, and these things are special to me. And I try to take great care of them uh, and make sure that they are protected. What God is offering the Israelites is that level of care and protection. It's different than what is being offered to Abraham. Abraham is promised generations, but Israel is promised prized possession. And so it's a unique covenant. Um, the second part of this answer is that God is no longer making this covenant with kind of one family unit, with just and one person, Abraham. He is now covenanting with all of Israel, the family of Jacob. The family of Jacob is made up of thousands and thousands of family units. And for Abraham's story, it's just small covenant agreements to a man who God has called specifically to lead his family where God chooses. God is now, in this part of Exodus, covenanting with all of Israel. And so the covenant takes a bit more of a nuanced approach. It looks uh, similar and you really see this through the book of Deuteronomy, but it looks similar to ancient Near East trees. Um, they were composed a certain way. Um, you'll see on the screen that they're composed in a certain way. You have a preamble and then a historical prologue, stipulations, reading the deposition, you have witnesses, and then you have curses and blessings. Um, and so you see this in the preamble of when we get to the Ten Commandments, it says, I am the Lord your God. That's in Exodus 2, 22. The historical prologue, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. This is who I am. This is what I've done. This is what you must do now. And so he gets Ten Commandments, other covenantal laws, and then there's the read. In 20, uh, verse 3, Moses reads the book of the covenant to all of Israel that is gathered. And then the witnesses are the heavens and earth as witnesses against you in Deuteronomy 4, 26. And then curses and blessings. Uh, you'll be my kingdom of priests, you'll be a holy nation in 19.6. Also in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 2, verses, and verses 15, it talks about, I will curse those who curse you, I will bless those who bless you. 
And so that we have this archaeological history and record is that this is how ancient trees were established between nation groups. And they would take a long time to establish and verify. And this is a, that God is working with the understanding that Israel has. This is how treaties are made. This is how they make a, uh, how God makes a treaty with his people as a covenant. In 1982, the Nuclear Disarmament Treaty, START One started its drafting process. It continued to be worked on between the U.S. and the Soviet Union until June 1991, and was signed in July of 1991. This is probably one of the most important treaties at the end of the 20th century, um, and it took nine years to write and get agreement and get signed. And it did not go into effect until 1994. Um, and so I think one of the reasons that God works this way is similar to how treaties are made today, right? They, it's a long process. Everybody has to understand what we're agreeing to, and God is doing that same thing. He is making sure that Israel understands what they are agreeing to. The second half of chapter 19 is all the instructions as to how God, how the people are supposed to present themselves before God. They're supposed to be clean. They're supposed to have all these ceremonial things. And God is preparing them to receive this covenant. And so the START Treaty was very specific about what had to be done with our nuclear weapons and the Soviet Union's nuclear weapons. And so then we get to chapter 20, which is very specific about what God expects from his people. In 20, uh, this is what it says in, in chapter 20. So this is then God spoke all these words. So they've been prepared to meet with God. God meets with all of Israel, and, he's, and this is what he starts off with saying. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You must have no other gods before me. Do not make an idol for yourself, no form whatsoever, of anything in the sky above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow down to them or worship them, because I, the Lord your God, am a passionate God. I punish children for their parents' sin, even to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But I am loyal and gracious to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commands. Do not use the Lord your God's name as if it were no, of no significance. The Lord won't forgive anyone who uses his name that way. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Six days you may work and do all your tasks, but the seventh day is a Sabbath for the Lord your God. Do not do any work on it. Not you, your sons or daughters, your male or female servants, your animals, or the immigrant who is living with you. Because the Lord made the heavens and the earth the sea and everything that is in them in six days, but rested on the seventh. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother so that your life will be, be long in the fertile land that the Lord your God has given you. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not testify falsely against your neighbor. Do not desire and try to take your neighbor's house. Do not desire and try to take your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox, donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the horn, and the mountain smoking, the people shook with fear and stood at a distance. They said to Moses, You speak to us and we'll listen, but don't let God speak to us or we'll die. Moses said to the people, Don't be afraid, because God has come only to test you and make sure you are always in awe of God, so that you don't sin. The people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness in which God was present. So I'm not going to break down each, each commandment, verse by verse. Um, and if you want a good explanation on why these commands are more, more, a bit more in-depth about this section of Exodus, I would recommend the Bible Project's Exodus Overview. Um, it's, a, it's really good. Um, uh, and I would, I've, used, I've used that a bit, too, when even writing these sermons. They, they did a very good job on um, talking about Exodus. Um, uh, so these are commonly called the Ten Commandments. However, Protestant, uh, Jewish, and Roman Catholic traditions actually disagree on where the first commandment starts. Um, so as an aside to a larger point, it is hard to make laws about commandments when there is disagreement among the three major religious interpretations of these commands. Um, there's a chart. Uh, and so uh, you can see these are the disagreements on what 
command is uh, hit square. Um, so the, the LXX is the Septuagint translation, uh, then you have Philo, and then you have the Reformed tradition, then you have the Talmud, you have the Samaritan tradition, you have Augustine's interpretation, uh, you have the Catholic Church, and you have the Lutheran Church interpretation. And so you can see, some of them disagree on which one is what, what command and where it belongs and, um, and different things. Um, and so there's, there's some commonality between uh, them, but there's a lot of disagreement as to what exactly is the first uh, through the Ten, command, Ten Commandments. And this gets me um, to the second part of this, is that it's not really important what is considered the Ten. The purpose of these commands is to educate the Israelites on how they should behave in relationship to God and to one another. The purpose isn't just to have ten. It's to give direction for the Israelites to follow. Most of the time, we think about um, these commandments as uh, severely negative and limiting. Um, the Ten Commandments are not the end-all be-all for our relationship with God. This is the starting point. This is the bare minimum for Israel. Don't have any other gods. Don't kill. Don't cheat. Don't covet your neighbor's stuff. Right? God expects this from his people. And then he will continue to add what they are supposed to do more so. This is just the beginning. Um... In the passage directly before this, God, meet, God asks them to present themselves a certain way, and then God gives them commands. God's commands here in chapter 20 are specific. He doesn't ask us to obey and then fail to provide what we have to do to follow Him. God doesn't expect obedience out of a failure to provide commands. We do not have a God who does not give us commands. He gives us exactly what we need to do to receive the promises we, we, He promises us. So the same thing happens with Jesus. Jesus does not fail to give us what we should do. We did one of His commandments today. Communion. He tells us to keep this as a remembrance of Him. He, he tells us the greatest commands, love the Lord your God, love your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. All of these things that God is promising us, if we obey, He tells us exactly what we need to do to receive that blessing. For Jesus, I think one of the greatest examples of this is found at the end of Matthew. Matthew 20, 16-20. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. Jesus came near and spoke to them, I receive all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day to the end of this present age. Jesus has spent years telling the disciples about the kingdom and about the expectation that they would be fishers of men. And the last thing that he says to them is part comfort and part command. Go and make disciples. I will be with you. He tells the disciples to do something specific. Teach about the commands and baptize people. The commands of Jesus to his church are not unknown. He is not vague to us. He has never been vague to us. He gives us flexibility. He doesn't tell us how we should love someone. He just says that we should love people. We should love our neighbor as ourselves. He doesn't say, only on the third Wednesday of each month, hold a meal with your neighbor, or tell your kids that you love them. Right? It's not, it doesn't limit like that. One of the things that I have had to learn about being a parent is how to set boundaries and expectations. If you set the boundaries and expectations too strict or too tight, then you will have to answer every single little question that they ask. <laughs> uh, but if you set them too loose, then you risk endangering your children. God here in Exodus, and then through the ministry of Jesus, is explaining what he wants them to do. He wants them not to be like other people. He wants them to care for their neighbor, not covet their neighbor. He wants to be our God, not another idol. 
And I think we still struggle with this today. Through God's grace, we are able to carry on further and further to his desires. But for a church, as a bit of a reality check, we are contingent just like Israel is. God chooses his church to do his work, but he can choose for it not to be doing his work just as much as he allowed, can allow it to flourish. I think that God raises up churches to engage his world where his world is at. And the question that we have as a church is, do we trust God enough to follow his commands? Right? It's the question that Israel's wrestling with. Do I trust this God enough to listen to him? It's the question in the minds of the disciples when they see Jesus last in Matthew. Do I trust God enough to do what he has asked of me? Some of them doubt. It says in the, at the beginning of that section of Matthew, some of them are doubting as they're going to meet with Jesus before he ascends. Do I trust God enough to do what he has asked of me? Is he worthy of my trust and commitment and energy and talent? Not into some vague idea of what it means to follow God, but something concrete. The other side of saying yes, he is worth listening to, he is worth following, he is worth giving our life to, is that he is offering us to be a nation of priests. He is offering us to be his people. He is offering us healing and life change. But we have to answer the question ourselves. We know the things that God has done. We know what God has laid out for the Israelites at the beginning of Exodus. He has brought them out of Egypt. He has provided them food and water. He has done things in your life. And it's a constant question of asking, is God worthy enough to put my trust in him today? Does he still keep his promises? Right? This is the question that almost every people throughout the Bible have to wrestle with. Is God worthy enough, is God trustworthy enough to put my faith into him? And I think we have to answer that for ourselves and for us as a church. It's not an easy question. It's not something that the Israelites get right immediately. In a few chapters, they build a golden calf. One of the first things is do not build an idol. <laughs> so it's not an easy road that we're going down. It's not an easy pathway that we've chosen. But I think the promises on the other side are worthwhile. I think the blessings of Jesus and the blessings of God are worthwhile. We join you in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for all the things that you have done. We know what you have done through Jesus, through the cross. We know what you have done for the Israelites. We've known what you've done for all people who follow you. And so the question that we continue to have, the question that you continue to ask your people, is will you follow me? Will you pick up the cross? Will you sell your possessions? Will you follow me? And we have to answer that for ourselves. So we ask that you give us the strength, you give us the courage to answer that question for ourselves. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you all to stand one last time as we under, under our son.
Our benediction for today is from John 10, verses 27 and onward. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. For my Father has given them to me, and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. You pray with me. Lord, we thank you that your voice is known to us, that you are not vague in what you ask of us to do, that you give us commands that we can follow. We ask that you continue to strengthen us through your spirit, that you would guide and lead us as we seek to follow you. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful week.